Okay, welcome everyone to this session on decolonizing transnationalism and introducing the translocal. I'm Seema Saida. I work for EA as a comms officer. Some of you might have seen me or met me before in other settings or in the last session. Um, so I'll be hosting the session today. So what I was, what I was in the middle of speaking to my breakout group about um, maybe coming up with what more do we feel like we need to learn about decolonization because so many of us are at different levels of understanding uh or of uh of exposure to the discourse some of us feel like we're quite uh confident about the things that uh, Gaminda talked others felt like there are new things that they didn't haven't heard about before or narratives they haven't heard about before so I think um, taking into the plenary a bit more of a discussion about what do we want to learn more about uh what what, what do we um, what are we familiar with? How can we change the discourse in our localities? Uh, bringing that into the plenary is good. So I think that moves us quite nicely into the second section, which is about practical decolonial organizing. And we have with us today Arti, who, uh, as I said, was on the Decolonial Europe Day project team and continues to be on that team, but also has done a lot of work in Palestine advocacy and has some recent experience having lived in South Africa, has just moved to Brussels, so is quite connected with the European NGO sector as well. So Arti, um, please do take it away. Thanks, Seema. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to be talking about, you know, what does it practically mean to, de well, to organize decolonially? Um, because something that I constantly feel that I'm asking myself um, is, you know, how do we do this in practice? Um, sometimes when we have this conversation, you know, in academia and, um, you know, there's a wealth of information, but it's a question that I'm always asking myself is what does this mean in our everyday lives and in, in how we go about our, our work, whether it's in our personal, you know, work that we do voluntarily, but also in our professional kind of capacities. Um, so I'm just going to take you through some of the um, reflections um, that came out of, of Decolonial Europe Day. And I know Alvaro, who was also part of the project team, um, please feel free to also add, because I think each of us individually um, reflected, but also collectively, you know, I think we're still in the process of, of reflecting. Um, so I'd like to start by firstly saying when, when we planned Decolonial Europe Day, um, it was decided amongst those of us who are obviously working in a voluntary capacity that um, we wanted to center those who are working, uh, who are at the forefront of decolonizing initiatives. So, you know, and this was encompassed of different streams, whether it is academics who are working on, you know, contested histories and, you know, challenging uh, European histories, or whether it was um, those working with migrant rights, as well as, um, you know, tackling Islamophobia in Europe, it was important to, to center these voices and this work in the process. So what this meant practically was that um, we worked with the partners to, to together to construct the workshops and, and the sessions that uh, we wanted to plan for the day. Um, from you know what topics were to be discussed to how they would conduct those sessions, and as many of you know, um, or if you haven't seen it, we also produced a um, a booklet where we were receiving contributions on basically um, the question on what does it mean to decolonize Europe, um, and I think that this was a a really great exercise because people that um, uh, contributed to the booklet, you know, they decided how they wanted to contribute to the booklet. So you will see there's the use of images, poems, essays. Um, it was very important for people to respond to this question in a way in which they, um, you know, how they wanted to represent um, the question on, on decolonizing. Um, but also reflecting on the booklet process, I think something that we discussed amongst ourselves was also language. And I think this has come up in my everyday work, but I think you know in many circles is, how do we talk about decolonizing, um, knowing that in many spaces, um, people are using English as a language and English being uh, a colonial language, um, which was imposed in, in many contexts, you know, including my country, South Africa, um, where it still dominates today. So 
something that we collectively reflected on in terms of putting together the booklet was to um, receive contributions to make sure it was unedited, um, recognizing though that they were still in English. So um, in a way that um, is exclusionary because um, I think going forward, this is something that we would co collectively want to reflect on is, you know, how do we make sure that people can write in their own languages and what does that look like? Um, and how does that, you know, contribute to this decolonial organizing and this process? Um, another thing that um, we wanted to do on the day, which I think is always challenging with online environments, is providing a safe space so that people um, could feel open to speaking up, to expressing their opinions. Um, and we worked with a facilitator to do this. Um, and I think that something, again, which um, we reflected on during the event, but also after the event, and I think I'd be really interested to hear, you know, the thoughts of this group is, Within creating a safe space, they also um, during the session we we heard some reflections on you know trauma that um, can um, you know it, the the conversation on decolonizing and just about talking about reparations and histories can be very triggering for people, especially um, you know those who have lived experience of um, living in countries that have been colonized, um, and I think. This is not something that we have a clear answer to, but I think we need to be constantly aware and collectively reflect on how do we have these conversations and how do we do this work? Um, what does that mean in terms of you know, reproducing violence, um, reproducing othering, and how do we counter that um, in this process to make sure that it's a safe space for everyone um, who wants to participate in the conversation? Um, and then I think something that Gurminder talked about, you know, is that the process of, of decolonizing is about, um, it's about mutual learning and unlearning. Um, and this is something as the team we, we made um, quite evident um, when we took on, you know, organizing Decolonial Europe Day is, you know, it's, it's a messy process. It's, it's not a perfect, you know, A, B, C, D kind of process where if you do this, this happens. Um, it's about sustaining the collaboration. So, you know, working with the partners and recognizing that even in the partners um, we worked with, that they, not they do not necessarily represent everyone working on decolonizing and that there were gaps in terms of, um, you know, which voices uh, were present on the day, but also reflecting on which other voices were left out of the conversation and need to be included. Um, and I think that goes to, um, again, what's something that Gurminder mentioned about, you know, recognizing that, you know, even if we're talking about decolonizing Europe, that this is connected to a global struggle. So how do we, um, you know, exchange and learn from, from people, for example, in South Africa or in Asia, in India, you know, where these conversations have been going on for much longer periods of time. Um, but then also, again, to... Um, um, reflecting on, you know, what sort of knowledge we use in this process and where this knowledge comes from, um, which is always a constant struggle. And even within our organize, organizing um, this day, you know, are we traditionally reflecting on, you know, um, pieces of knowledge that have come from, from Europe, um, not saying that, you know, these aren't valid, but also making space for um, the knowledge building and the development that's been happening in the global south that often doesn't reach um, the side of the world because it's deemed as, you know, not, um, not good enough or it's, it's often othered. So this is something I think that um, we collectively reflected on post-organization of event. Um, and as I said, it's about the process itself was, um, I think it's important to recognize that it's a messy process of, of self-reflection. And we have to ensure that there's, you know, a degree of vulnerability um, understanding that um, the conversation will be uncomfortable at many times for, you know, people within the project team also having uncomfortable conversations on their positionality, on their privilege, but also, um, again, linking to what Gurminder was saying, you know, understanding our own complicity in the system and what does that mean in terms of um, how we organize decolonially. I think it's very important to at least have a conversation about it um, and also understand that everyone 
even in the project team, for example, comes from very different positionalities, different places, uh, and different histories as well, and how that can impact on the organization process. Um, and I touched on, um, again, you know, the importance of connecting the struggle, not just to, to Europe, but outside of Europe. And to what Seema mentioned about um, the work on, on Palestinian rights is something that also I think came up on in the session, if I'm not mistaken, Seema, you were in the session um, on Islamophobia. Um, and as a South African, I um, have very strong connections to the Palestinian cause because of you know, the history of uh, Nelson Mandela and, and the BDS movement, et cetera. But, um, in bringing this conversation into European spaces, I've often um, encountered a lot of, um, I won't say backlash, but I mean resistance um, in, in bringing up the conversation. And I think um, for me, for example, when we were talking about de uh, decolonial Europe Day in the session on Islamophobia, it was very important to ask the question on how do we you know, bring Palestinian rights into this conversation of decolonization um, and think about Palestinian freedom through a decolonial lens. Um, because I think sometimes it's thought of as one, it's a very contentious issue, but also it's, you know, again, this issue of this is happening there, it doesn't really impact on, on our um, positionalities and our everyday happenings. And then I would obviously argue that it, it very much has a, a huge impact. Um, but thinking about the Palestinian work that I, I, I did in my previous role and working with Palestinians who um, are obviously encountered with many difficulties in, in their everyday work as civil society. Um, and the big question for me was, as someone who's trying to do this work, how do we um, you know, um, be very conscious of, but also uh, refrain from reproducing the othering that is happening. And this is just not only with, you know, the Palestinian context, there's many other contexts, if you, if you apply to migrant rights, et cetera, there's a lot of othering that's happening in Europe. And I think it's also very much linked to, um, you know, it's colonial history and very much entrenched in the systems of the way we speak, the way we um, organize as a city, for example. Um, so I think, one thing that I was very conscious of when working with Palestinian activists was um, the language we use, um, specifically in the, in, in the case of, of Palestinian rights, because um, the language is very colonial or can reproduce the colonial lens. So, you know, whether we call it as Israeli apartheid, when we talk about, you know, um, the types of force that is used, et cetera, um, the type of language that we use can be incredibly empowering powerful in um, shaping the narrative, but also challenging this colonial othering that we're seeing in, in many contexts, not just in Palestine, but in many other um, contexts for excluded groups. Um, and I think the last thing or the question that I had when reflecting on the session is, um, how do we deal with decolonizing, knowing that many of us in our everyday lives um, have to engage in, you know, coloniality or systems of colonialism every day. Um, and I think, uh, Nicolo, you brought this up in our um, breakout session about, you know, the transformation of empires. So, um, you know, this coloniality that, that exists and is a, surrounds all of us, um, we are part of that system. And how do we um, reflect on that, but also you know, decolonize, but also make decolonization about decolonizing. I know that's a lot of, of words, but um, uh, yeah, so I'll stop there, but thank you so much again. Alvaro, please jump in if I've um, left out anything. Thank you so much, Arti. Uh, that was really, really comprehensive and raised a lot of questions as well. So the next uh, part of the session is to open the floor out to the plenary to discuss what we think about practical organizing, to respond to some of the points that Arti's made, respond to some of the points that were made in the video by Gamindo about how it's also about you know, returning that wealth that was violently taken and whether we're really ready in Europe to grapple with what that actually means. Um, so yeah, now we will open up the floor. I did have some questions to structure the discussion, but I do think 
a more free, free flowing discussion is also fine. So I've posted the questions in the chat and I think thinking about our own lo localities as well and how we can connect up is important in terms of the translocal dimension so we aren't doing things siloed uh, and, and that we are connecting. 